if I understood well from the movie, uh, the US government uh, took some specific or proactive steps to send out the music bands to the Soviet Union. Um, do you think the government should do this kind of cultural um, steps or cultural diplomacy? Is this for me or is this <laughs> for both? <laughs> you first, you first okay. So I, I, I'll let him speak about whether the government should or should not. Um, however, um, some people think after they get confused with the film that the CIA did create rock and roll and that the government created it to weaken the communist control of the youth behind the Iron Curtain. That did not happen. Uh, it started organically, on its own. In fact, uh, in those years, in the middle 50s, uh, local governments in America were trying to stop rock and roll because they thought it was very dangerous and, and dangerous to their children. And so the US government wasn't anxious to promote this, but they realized through 1955, 56, 57, they realized what an impact it was causing. Because remember, in West Berlin, it was controlled not only by the Soviets, but by the French, the British, and the Americans. And in West Berlin, you had radio stations, the French, British, Americans, and West Germans, and every day they were broadcasting rock music because they realized the kids were attracted to this and maybe if they were attracted to it they would spend less time thinking of the propaganda that was coming out of the Kremlin and um, I, one of the stories that I was trying to find out uh, uh, was Elvis Presley's story because um, he came out and became famous between two wars. It was between the Korean War and the Vietnam War. And generally, um, people who are rich, who are famous, who are wealthy, who are friends of politicians, they can find a way to get out of joining the army. And here, in 1958, he may have been the most popular human being on the planet at that time. Everybody knew him where other artists were playing in 1,000-seat venues, he was playing in 80,000-seat venues. And yet, he got drafted into the Army. And to me, it seems too coincidental. Now, I know his manager, who had great power and influence, um, was wanted for murder in Netherlands years earlier. He was in America illegally, Colonel Parker. He did not have an American passport. He couldn't leave the country. And I just have this theory that maybe pressure was put on Colonel Parker. And Colonel Parker asked Elvis to do this. And he said, it will look good because here you're supporting the country. And he did not perform one time in his two years uh, in the army in Germany and had recorded 12 records before he went in and they would release them every month or so but every day he was in a tank squadron 30 miles 50 kilometers from the Czech border for two years and every day they broadcast everything he did that day across the Iron Curtain and as the film said the East German Communist press labeled him public enemy number one. But by 1958, Radio Free Europe realized they had to use this weapon. NATO had put out a magazine in their uh, NATO review, and they had written that this is a powerful weapon. And West German press wrote that it may be the most powerful weapon American had. And in 56, when Hungary had its revolution, uh, because of our broadcast on Voice of American Radio Free Europe, the youth in Hungary believed that America would come and save them when the Soviets attacked. 
we didn't, and we lost the youth of Hungary. And this was how they thought we could get them back. And so Radio Free Europe, which is based in Munich, they created their first uh, top 40 radio like we have in America. They'd have the top 40 hits. They would tell who the artist is. They would tell the story of each one. And they had a refugee from Hungary who spoke, was the disc jockey, just like an American disc jockey. And it became the most popular thing immediately in Hungary. And because of that, they created one for every country behind the Iron Curtain, including Czechoslovakia. So they did start using it, but it was still years, it would be 19 more years, 1977, that they finally decided we will allow a rock band to go to the Soviet Union. They, they were afraid that rock and roll, sex, drugs, you know, they would get arrested and it would create an international furor. So the government did do that, they did participate, but like with, with um, when the, uh, uh, the nitty gritty dirt band went to the Soviet Union, it wasn't just America's choice. I mean, these discussions had been going on for a year but with the Kremlin and with Washington. So they had to agree to it. And the first band that was suggested was a group called Deep Purple. They were a big group. And the Soviets said no because they had two electric guitars and they had two drum sets, so they thought that would be too loud. And so then the, the man, the, there was a, a man with bald head and a white beard. He was the one who, he spent five years talking to the State Department, and he worked for the State Department, into using rock and roll as a tool in their arsenal. And he said, so I realized, okay, they couldn't do a real heavy rock band. And so he recommended a, a folk rock duo who had several hit records called America, Horse Without Name, and, and they were two very handsome young men. And the Soviets looked at the album cover and they said, no, 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 this will elicit homosexuality in our youth. So then they passed on America, and the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band had just, and they played hard rock, they played country, they played bluegrass, they were famous for that. And they had just done an album with some old bluegrass musicians, and it was mostly acoustic album, and it sold millions of records. So that's the record they played for the Soviets. So the Soviets promoted it as a folk ensemble would come over. And they arrived in a plane from America in Tbilisi, Georgia, and they came out with PA system sound speakers that were bigger than hotel rooms, and the KGB freaked out. And 28 shows were sold out that a national TV show which had been agreed to and signed between the two governments. But as you saw, two years later, when Elton John come, they wouldn't let him bring a band. No electric instruments, no drums. Okay.